And welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. We do thank you for joining us. Now, if you are asking the question, what is this show particularly all about? Well, we bring you a forum discussing and providing deeper understanding on the issues and inequities that so many people and communities face, things such as systemic inequalities to pressing social problems. Our guests provide multiple perspectives as well as insights, helping us to better understand and address these challenges. So we invite you to stay connected with us as the Social Justice Forums starts right now. And since 1913, the Anti-Defamation League, better known as the ADL, has been at the forefront of combating hate worldwide. As the leading anti-hate organization, the ADL operates regionally to swiftly address instances of hate and anti-Semitism. Dedicated to confronting all manifestations of prejudice, engaging with elected officials and educating teachers, children, and collaborating with law enforcement to create a more inclusive society. Joining me now to share more about the ADL New York, New Jersey, and what they're doing to combat hate in our area is Regional Director Scott Richmond. And uh, Scott, good to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to have you back. And when we talk about uh, the work that's going on, obviously, I know you got your hands full, but when we talk about what's happening around the country and even around the world, let's talk more locally. Uh, we're seeing a rise in you know, extremism. A lot of people are really uh, taken aback by the extremism that's really rearing its ugly head. Uh, what are we doing right now and what are you doing to really address this issue uh, from the ADL perspective? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we've seen a, a rise in extremist activity uh, on both the left and the right. Uh, ADL has been tracking extremists and uh, disrupting extremist activity really uh, for decades. Uh, we have something called the Center on Extremism. Uh, our Center on Extremism has uh, threat intelligence analysts who, uh, who follow uh, these, um, these bad actors. Uh, we do supply tips to law enforcement when we see threats out there, especially on social media. A uh, very important part of uh, of our work, uh, and uh, we are also uh, an educator. Uh, we put out a great deal of information on extremist groups. You can find it on our website, adl.org. Uh, so, for example, groups like the Patriot Front, uh, that's active in this region, or the New Jersey European Heritage Association. Uh, these are white supremacist groups um, that are active. You can find backgrounders there. You can find on our website. Uh, a, a, a symbol, hate symbols database. Uh, so there are many hate symbols, uh, and unfortunately, hate symbols continue to uh, uh, to grow. Uh, we we get new ones all the time. Uh, so law enforcement constantly uses our hate symbols database to decode what they're seeing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I spent three days in Buffalo following the top supermarket tragedy. Uh, I I went up there on Saturday night as soon as I heard what had happened. I went there first and foremost to show my solidarity with the, the black community uh, who had suffered such a horrific, uh, horrific tragedy. Uh, but I also went to, uh, to brief law enforcement. Uh, and one of the things we briefed law enforcement on was the meaning of the etchings on the gun. Uh, so the gun that was used, you may not know, had, had many symbols on it. Uh, and uh, our, uh, our Center on Extremism had decoded that. Uh, and uh, was helping law enforcement understand what they were. Some of them were symbols which harkened back to prior uh, prior episodes of uh, uh, of extremist uh, murders. Uh, so uh, really, very very important. So ADL is out there, uh, really on the front lines uh, in finding extremism. I can talk much more about it, but that's that's a quick overview. Yeah, I mean, I, that, I want to stay right there for a second because I think it's pretty huge the fact that uh, you can assist law enforcement and really seeing and dealing with this because this is something that you deal with on a much broader basis and a much more daily basis uh, than sometimes law enforcement does. So uh, talk about that relationship with law enforcement and how you guys have been able to actually work that out where you've been, uh, you know, a credible messenger and a trusted partner. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, our law enforcement needs a criminal predicate. And that's, uh, this is uh, stated in the Constitution. Uh, criminal predicate to follow bad actors. So uh, we don't need that. We're a nonprofit organization, and we can follow bad actors uh, as we choose. 
Uh, so we've developed relationships with law enforcement over the years as a trusted partner, providing intelligence. We're really the intelligence arm of the Jewish community. We're a Jewish organization, uh, but a Jewish organization that fights all forms of hate and extremism, believing deeply that you can't just fight against one form of hate uh, and not others. So uh, we certainly found it to fight against persecution of Jews, anti-Semitism, uh, but we fight all forms of hate. So our relationship with law enforcement uh, is deep, and it's not just about providing intelligence. Uh, it's also, of course, having that relationship in place when there are acts of hate, acts of anti-Semitism. So, for example, we work really closely with the New York, uh, the NYPD uh, Hate Crimes Task Force, very important part of, uh, uh, of the fight against hate uh, in the city. Uh, it's really a model for other cities. Uh, you know, this is a, a very large task force and one that's extremely active uh, in fighting against uh, fighting against hate, we also are the largest non-governmental provider of uh, education programs to uh, law enforcement. Uh, we, we're talking here about anti-Semitism, extremism, hate crimes. These are topics that we uh, we offer modules regularly to uh, to law enforcement. A uh, very important part of our work. So it really goes both ways. Uh, you know, we need that relationship in order to fight hate. Uh, but we're also providing a valuable service to law enforcement. Uh, in fact, um, ADL New York, New Jersey was recently honored by the FBI. Uh, each year, the FBI director, uh, in this case, Christopher Ray, national director, gives out something called the Director's uh, Community Award. Uh, it's given to uh, one nonprofit or a civil organization uh, in a, a, a region where an, an FBI office is located. There are 56 offices of the FBI. Uh, so each office could nominate uh, one organization. And FBI Newark uh, nominated ADL New York, New Jersey this year, and we received it. And I was really honored to represent a ADL at, at FBI headquarters receiving this award. And it's because of that deep relationship and unfortunately, uh, a series of incidents in New Jersey that we dealt with last year that brought us into very close contact with uh, with the FBI. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about another highlight of yours, and that's uh, you're going to actually be co-chairing uh, the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Um, and share with us, I mean, first of all, your thoughts on being able to co-chair and how did this come about? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really uh, very heartwarming, I must say. We were asked by the King family uh, the King family, who are hosting this anniversary of the March on Washington, uh, along with the NAACP, National Action Network, uh, and other groups, um, we were asked uh, to be one of the lead sponsors of this year's March on Washington, taking place on August 26th. It's Saturday, August 26th. It's the 60th anniversary, and there'll be uh, there'll be speeches at the Lincoln Memorial. A uh, wonderful way to, to commemorate the 60th anniversary. And we are out there uh, reaching out to the Jewish community, um, to synagogues and to Jewish organizations and asking them to help us uh, bring a big group. Uh, Jewish community is certainly a big ally uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this fight for civil rights that continues. Uh, you know, it's interesting because the, the organizers of this do not call it a commemoration. They call it a continuation because the fight for civil rights has not ended. Uh, we're continuing that battle 60 years later, uh, and ADL uh, and the Jewish community are certainly strong allies. So we're very honored uh, to be a part of that, and we are uh, we are looking to bring the Jewish community out in force. And actually, since it's a, a Friday night Saturday uh, arrangement, we are um, uh, and and uh, many observant Jews observe Shabbat uh, on those days. Uh, we are making a special arrangements for that because we want to make sure that everybody feels included uh, and can be a part of this uh, special event. Yeah, so how's that going to happen uh, in terms of with Shabbat happening and talk about, you know, what's going to happen during that time? Because uh, it is going to be a very special time, but also it's, uh, you know, it, it runs up right against the clock. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're making arrangements for synagogues that are close by and kosher food and um, a big Shabbat dinner on Friday night at a nearby hotel. Um, so, so lots of ways that we're, we're making people feel uh, included. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, I think it's going to be a really very special event. There's going to be remarks from the King family. Certainly our CEO, Jonathan Greenblatt, will be speaking. Uh, and uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, different different leaders uh, in the in the Jewish community and in, in the Black community for sure. 
uh, most of the partners are from the black community. But interestingly enough, uh, there's a broad spectrum of partners, Unidos, from the Latino community, um, uh, an Asian American organization. Now, the original March on Washington in 1963 did not have such broad participation. That was really led uh, uh, by, by the black community, and, and the, uh, the leadership up there was the black community. But this year, it's, it's going to be a broader coalition to show that we are all in this together, fighting for, uh, for civil rights. Yeah. Uh, I know you also are the host of a podcast uh, from the front lines, and uh, talk about that, because when we talk about combating hate, that's a lot that's been discussed on the podcast, uh, and it's become a great vehicle to be able to share and talk, and also uh, to get some tremendous insight on uh, the fight against hate. When you categorize the fight against hate, um, talk to me about, first of all, let's talk about the podcast, and I'll come back to uh, the fight against hate. Give us a little bit about the podcast. So I, I really appreciate the plug. It's called From the Front Lines. Uh, I actually just finished my 100th episode. Uh, so there is a lot in the archive that people can go through. They're quick, they're just 10 minutes. It's once a week for 10 minutes. I lift up one ADL issue that I think is super important this week. I lift up a valued colleague. Usually I'm interviewing a colleague. I have uh, such tremendous uh, uh, colleagues that I work with who are so smart, who are doing such incredible work, and I lift up their work once a, once a week. So for example, this week's podcast is about the March on Washington, and I interviewed my colleague Shira Goodman, who is the staff person. I asked her similar questions to what you asked me. What's going to happen? How do we get involved? All these kinds of things. Uh, and that's this week's podcast. Last week's podcast was about a first of its kind report about attacks against the LGBTQ plus community. We've seen a, a tremendous rise, especially during uh, Pride Month, June. Uh, and that's uh, very, very troubling. So we put out a first of its kind report from one of our experts in our center on extremism who is tracking attacks against the LGBTQ plus community. Coming up next week, uh, it's going to be a podcast uh, about uh, global anti-Semitism uh, and what we're tracking around the world. So it could really be anything. Uh, and you can find it. It's called From the Front Lines. Front Lines is one word, and it's with an S at the end, plural. You can find it on Apple, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Uh, and I hope that people will listen and, uh, and subscribe to it. Yeah, Scott, you, you touched on global anti-Semitism, or I guess say global anti-Semitism, and, you know, the, the fact of the matter is when we look at across the world, there are so many people who are trying to do the right thing, but yet and still it seems as though these extremists and those uh, really pushing the envelope get a lot of the attention. But from your perspective, on a global perspective, what are we seeing? Are we seeing more of an increase, or are we just seeing the fact that more is actually being broadcast? Yeah, I, unfortunately, we're seeing an increase. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to know what was always in people's minds, but we, we certainly track incidents, uh, and we've seen an increase, increase globally. And it's not just about uh, anti-Semitism. We're talking about an increase in hate. If you just look even at the FBI hate crimes data, uh, you know, hatred, racism against the black community, Islamophobia, uh, homophobia, uh, certainly attacks against the Asian community. You see all of this, uh, unfortunately, on the rise, certainly in this country and globally. Social media is a huge driver of, uh, of this. It, it, uh, it gives haters the kind of megaphone that they never had. Uh, it gives them a way to find others uh, who, uh, uh, who share their radical views, their extremist views, and it, it gives them a way to... Uh, uh, to find others who may not share their views but are susceptible to it. Um, so, for example, I, I mentioned that I, I spent uh, three days in Buffalo. I mean, this is this is the tragedy that was uh, was born in the internet. Uh, a person who was radicalized on social media, who may not have been going down that path, but was susceptible to it in some way, uh, and ended up uh, committing this horrific act. So for people who want to find out more, be of support, be an ally, because uh, we could all use allies these days, uh, particularly in the fight for good. What can people do to align themselves with the ADL, particularly in the New York, New Jersey area? Well, I'll say generally, uh, if you want to become involved, just check out uh, ADL.org is our general uh, website, and you can, go to, uh, you can go to the New York, New Jersey section of that. We have lots of events. Uh, you can follow us on social media and amplify our important messages. We're putting messages out on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, I'm on threads as well, Facebook. 
uh, LinkedIn, uh, you can find me there. Uh, certainly from the front lines uh, is, a, is a vehicle for, uh, for getting involved. And I'll say one other thing, we are having a very special event in the Bronx uh, on August 20th, Sunday, August 20th. It's the Walk Against Hate. Uh, so 10 a.m., uh, 10 to 12 in Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx. Once a year, we ask everybody to come out and, and uh, show their solidarity with those who are fighting against hate, uh, with the Walk Against Hate. Take a step. To, uh, to fight against hate. We're going to have lots of, of tables out there, lots of swag, um, great speakers, and uh, I'm hoping that the whole community will come out uh, and show their solidarity on our website. Uh, you can sign up for it there, Walk Against Hate. Just, just Google Walk Against Hate, ADL, New York, New Jersey, something like that, uh, and you will, uh, you'll find it. So I hope to shake everybody's hand on Sunday, August 20th from 10 to 12 in Van Cortlandt Park. Yeah, before we go, Scott, talk to me about New York, New Jersey, because here we are, uh, you know, of course, the Big Apple, and right there you got New Jersey, but uh, you've got other big metropolises across. Uh, you've got Chicago, Atlanta, the West Coast, uh, Florida, Texas. Uh, what are you seeing amongst your colleagues in the ADL? Is New York and New Jersey the hotbed right now, or are there other parts of the country that you would define as uh, a hotbed? So uh, ADL is an organization that's 25 offices across the country. I'm the director of one of those offices. We have an office in Chicago and in Dallas and in San Francisco and in Boston and in, in, uh, uh, in Florida and Washington, all over the country. Uh, and those offices are also experiencing a similar rise. Uh, some of these issues are more regional uh, where, you know, for example, in New York and New Jersey, we have a particular problem with uh, assaults against the Orthodox community, visibly identifiable Jews. You don't have so many Orthodox Jews in, in these other cities, so uh, it's, not, it's not as much of an issue. Uh, but you have other issues in, uh, in other locales. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, there, there is a difference, but overall, uh, a general rise in, uh, uh, in hate across the system. Uh, we've certainly seen that. 2022, for example, was the highest year on record for anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, it was a record in, in New York, it was a record in New Jersey, but it was a record in many other states uh, as well. Uh, and I will say that across the nation, if we look at all 50 states, uh, there is no state that has more anti-Semitic incidents than New York by far, and that's been a pattern for, uh, for years. New Jersey is often number two, number three. Last year it was number three, it was edged out by California. And if you add in Florida and Texas, you're going to have well over 50% of the incidents. So that's that's often related, though, to the number of Jews who uh, who live in these places, uh, large Jewish populations. Uh, between New York and New Jersey, for example, uh, you're approaching uh, about half the Jewish population in this country. Yeah. Well, Scott, we got to leave it there. Thank you. The numbers are harrowing, but yet and still great work being done on the on the ground from you, and really the fight against uh, hate anti-Semitism. Thank you so much for being with us as always, and uh, hopefully we get a chance to catch up when you're here in the Bronx. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All righty. Well, we're taking a quick break. We'll be back with more here on the Social Justice Forums right after this. Where did the time go? Somehow I lost all those years. Where did the time done the hard part. You quit smoking. Now do the easy part and get scanned for lung cancer. If you smoked, you may still be at risk, but early detection could save your life. Talk to your doctor and learn more at savedbythescan.org. We all know what it's like to feel alone, but it just takes one new connection. Want to get out of here? to empower many. This is unbelievable. It doesn't take a superhero to bring forces together. We all have the power to reach out. Let's go! 
and help someone feel like they belong. Pretty cool, huh? We are stronger together. You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. Thanks for hearing me out, bro. Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, okay? so sad. You've got a roof over your head. Bro, you gotta stop with that depression stuff. That's a white people thing. Escúchame, en esta casa los hombres no lloran. You alright? It just feels like it's coming from everywhere. Do you want to talk about it? Thanks for hearing me out, bro. Appreciate it. You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, OK? And we are back. The South Bronx's history since the 1950s is marked by deep-seated social injustices, including white flight, landlord abandonment, economic shifts, demographic changes, and the construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway. These historical factors continue to shape the area today, giving rise to initiatives like South Bronx Unite. Residents of the South Bronx strive for fair access to clean air, nutritious food, affordable quality housing, and also health care, education, stable employment, and liv livable wages, plus a whole lot more. Here to share more, we've got the Clean Air Program Coordinator, Leslie Vasquez, with us. And uh, Leslie, good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. You know, I'm, I'm rambling down a list of so many things, but it's really an issue because when you think about uh, the issues that South Bronxites have faced for such a long time, um, I've, I've named about eight there, but there's so many more that you can name, but progress is being made. Correct. That's so, correct. So give us a little. Yeah. So... Uh, we represent the Mott Haven and Port Morris neighborhoods of the South Bronx, and we are located in a peninsula where we have no access to our waterfront. Um, our waterfront is ground zero for warehouses, polluting facilities like power plants, waste transfer stations. Um, we have three major highways crossing through the centers of our community. Um, on top of the lack of health service opportunities, um, on top of lack of employment resources, um, and many other things. Um, because of that, our community ha is extremely vulnerable compared to other communities in New York City. Um, we have one of the highest asthma rates in the whole country, and we have one of the lowest green space per capita um, in the city as well. Because of all of those injustices combined, our community has to experience cumulative health impacts like asthma and other respiratory illnesses. Um, and so what South Bronx Unite tries to do is tries to fix those issues so that our community isn't as vulnerable as they are today. Um, we want to be as resourceful, as proactive as possible. And the only way that we do that is through our community engagement and through the support of our um, community members and whatnot. Yeah. Sometimes community members have a hard time getting on board with advocacy only because they're so overburdened by what's going on in their own in, in their own lives. What are you finding among South Bronx sites these days? Because uh, as we know, um, the issues are many, but where there's strength, there's numbers, right? There's strength in numbers. How are you coming along in the strength in numbers fight? Yeah, so we try to be as active as possible um, with an organization of three people. Um, we are a little strapped in capacity, but nonetheless, we still try to um, have community engagement efforts every single month, especially throughout the, the warmer months. Um, and so we host community events monthly, um, and we collaborate with other organizations to do the same in other parts of New York City. Um, but the more people that we, uh, that we bring to our, our events, to, to provide purpose and intention to our programs, to collect their feedback, to better shape our policies and better shape our, our efforts moving forward. Um, that's what really guides our work. That's what moves us forward. Um, and so 
like you said, it is tricky to get people to come outside and advocate when they're overburdened by everything that's happening in their lives. Um, but really, the South Bronx is so beautiful because it's so rich in culture. Um, everybody's always outside. There's always something going on. And even if you don't know about an event that's happening, you just happen to stumble across one. And so engagement is, is very, very lively in the South Bronx. Um, and although we would love to get many, many, many more participants um, to support our work and to, to see what we're doing, um, the participants that we do have now and the people who support our work are incredible people. Um, and they're residents of the area. Um, they experience all of these injustices firsthand. Um, and so we see that as great numbers, regardless of how many they are. So when you talk about being an organizer for the clean air, obviously we want to see better air in the South Bronx. We'll see a better air across the borough. We've, how much have these wildfires really impacted and further compounded uh, what we're seeing in the South Bronx? Yeah, um, because we have such a high concentration of pollution, the wildfires that came from Canada a couple of weeks back were so much more visible um, in our community specifically because we already had high pollution rates. Um, and so although the wildfires were experienced all throughout um, New York State and other parts of the country, the South Bronx had worst uh, air quality issues from before. And we also had to deal with other cumulative health impacts in the past, meaning that when we had an extreme weather event like the, um, the Canada wildfire emergency, our communities were that much more vulnerable because they were already affected in other ways before. Um, we had higher hospitalization rates, like we do always, but um, with the Canada wildfires, it was that much more apparent how, um, how much of a disproportion there is with the resources that are available compared to other parts of the city. We hear a lot about the word racism. We talk about that here on, on, on the show quite, quite a lot. But when we talk about environmental racism, mm -hmm. that takes on a different type. Yes. Somebody may not be familiar with environmental racism. So let's educate viewers, first of all, on what is environmental racism. Yeah, so environmental racism is deeply rooted in the racist policies that we've had to deal with for, uh, for decades. Um, because of redlining, um, the South Bronx is considered as, it's not as desirable because of that, um, of that uh, stereotype that was placed from many years ago. And because of that, there has been less funding, there's less programs, um, and there is less consideration of the residents in the area. All of that uh, combined together has led to us becoming more vulnerable. And our environment is working against us because we don't have the government to help support us. Um, like I mentioned, we have higher rates of pollution. We have um, a high concentration of polluting facilities compared to many other parts of the city. And so all of these things aren't a coincidence. There is so much evidence that proves that our community, who is primarily of color, who is primarily low income, um, and who faces a myriad of different injustices, they're the ones who are experiencing the brunt of environmental impacts. They're the ones who are experiencing the environment at a completely different level than the rest of the people in New York City and other parts of the country as well. So when it comes to environmental racism, all of the, the historical um, impacts that our communities have had to deal with are combined with the externalities that our, our environment brings. And it, it doesn't help our case. Um, we are vulnerable because of the lack of, um, of prioritization that our communities get. And all of that together is, is receding us back. Yeah. And yeah, that's what we're trying to fight against. What about the response? Because as we sound the alarm, the question is whether or not anybody's come to aid mm -hmm. and whether or not that, that, that's gonna be, my needs are gonna be met. Because we know that when you ride along the Cross Bronx, and you're stuck in traffic and those fumes are out there, uh, not only do they impact the driver behind, but it leaves behind that air that is 
breathed in by so many residents. And we know about the asthma. We know about high blood pressure and, 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 and all these other things that have been these health factors that are actually attributed. But when we sound the alarm and we need the parties to be to come to the table and say, listen, we're going to do something about that. Where are we at? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the biggest contributor to pollution in that South Bronx area um, is uh, cars, trucks, and medium to heavy duty vehicles. Medium to heavy duty vehicles are essentially any uh, vehicle that is larger than 10,000 pounds. So any school bus, a large pickup truck would be considered one of those. They're mostly run by diesel, which is extremely problematic in terms of the health impacts that it brings to the community. Um, and because, like you said, that exhaust lingers in the air, that's the air that our communities breathe. And so my role as a clean air program organizer um, is to transition the South Bronx to a fully electric um, medium to heavy duty vehicle sector so that we can reduce those levels of pollution, being that the warehouses, the, the, the highways, and everything um, in the area is contributing um, to that high rate of pollution. And so we at South Bronx Unite are trying to, to mitigate that issue by electrifying the vehicles that um, are impacting our area. And that's one aspect, but um, the city is also working on implementing a congestion pricing proposal um, which is essentially going to redirect um, a whole bunch of traffic into the South Bronx. And we're trying to fight against that because we don't need any more pollution. We cannot make our communities any more vulnerable than what they already are. And so at South Bronx Unite, we're trying to, we are trying to avoid that issue of redirection of traffic into our area. Um, and those are some of the things that we're doing actively to, to prevent those things. How can the public join in on this? Because obviously public support continues with, you know, the more the numbers, uh, the greater the, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? So uh, how do we create the squeak, if you will, um, so that way we can be able to get more people out, active, combining uh, forces with South Bronx United? Yeah, so there are public comment periods, there's feedback discussions, there's community workshops for all of these efforts that are happening uh, for congestion pricing, for electrification, um, and for many other policies. Um, the best way that a community member can help is by being active in those engagement efforts, mm -hmm. um, by providing that feedback, um, by, by voicing their lived experiences in the community. They're able to shape and hone the policies that we're trying to build. Um, and so being uh, an active participant in engagements like those is super important. Um, we have a newsletter as well as many other grassroots environmental justice organizations in the city where we share those efforts, where we share action items that people can, can take on, like signing on to a petition or submitting a comment letter. Um, and so those are efforts that we try to do that help our community become more involved. Um, and you can sign up for things like those in our website or, um, or any other environmental justice organizations. The biggest question I have is when it comes to equity, right? We always have this conversation when we talk about social justice, equality, and equity. Two totally different things. Yeah. And, you know, while people will push the envelope and say we've got equality, the reality is that many times there's not equity. Um, and so how do we, why is it so challenging to see equity just in fundamental areas mm -hmm. where it seems like a no-brainer, but it seems like we've got to have five meetings and, and six conversations to be able to just bring equity to something that seems so regular. That's actually a great point because you mentioned that the Canada wildfires is something that um, is something that is pressing and we've had issues like the Canada wildfires, like that awful air quality, maybe not as bad, but the South Bronx always has bad air quality. Right. Um, and when you mention equity, why is it that this air quality issue becomes so important when it affects the rest of the world, but not when it affects communities of color that are vulnerable and have been historically marginalized like the South Bronx? When it comes to equity, we have to include communities that are marginalized, that are vulnerable first. 
and then address the rest of the world and the the um, the rest of the issues that trickle down to other communities. Not saying that other community communities aren't vulnerable or that that they don't need help, um, but our community has been suffering for so long, and again, we have so much proof that we are our health is deteriorating on a daily basis because of environmental impacts that are outside of our control. Um, and so in order for us to do this equitably, we need to include communities members' voices and we need to address the, the communities that are vulnerable first um, because there's a lot of prioritization for other communities that are wealthier and that have resources and funds, um, but they already have proper air quality, they already have green spaces. We need to address the ones that don't have any of that uh, consideration first. Right. And uh, so what's on your radar right now uh, that people can be paying attention to to say, listen, uh, I'm going to laser in on and possibly join the fight? Yeah. So we are working on implementing 25 air quality monitors throughout the South Bronx. Um, with that data, we will make it publicly accessible. It's going to be transparent so that anybody can access it at whatever time. Um, there's a lot of air quality monitoring efforts throughout the Bronx and other parts of the city, but we really wanted to focus on having very detailed data for our South Bronx area specifically. Um, we will be moving forward with that work in the next couple of months, um, and we will be uh, adding stories to it. We will be implementing community members' voices and feedback so that it can back up our programs and it could justify why we are doing the work that we are. Um, and so, like I said, we have newsletters where we, um, where we provide actions that can help us move forward. And so to stay tuned, to stay active, um, we encourage people to participate in as many efforts as possible. Uh, well, Leslie, we gotta leave it there, but thank you so much for joining us and being with us. And we'll continue to do to follow the work. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate you. And we'll be back with more right after this. Most hiring algorithms would scream me out. Some bosses couldn't see me as a leader. I've run this place for 20 years, but I still need to prove that I'm more than what you see on paper. I've been running code as long as I've been able to reach a keyboard. This is what I do. It's second nature for me, coordinating 100 details at once. It's the way my mind works. I have a very mechanical brain. I sold them on my skills. You gotta be so good, they can't ignore you. My magic is... Analytics important. and empathy. That's how I'm getting clients. You have to have the confidence in yourself to show up and defy the odds. I am more than who I am on paper. I never got a college degree. And today, I'm the CEO of my own company. People want to tell me I'm one in a million when actually I'm one of millions. Stars are all around us. It's time for them to shine. If you're buzzed and doing this, to make yourself feel okay to drive, ZWX. Not okay to drive. Y G K L V W. Uh, regular you. Even though we didn't grow up together, he's my favorite brother. Hey, sis. I'm the baby of the family, and he's the gentle giant. What you know about poor George? Man, please, that's a classic. You know when they say people Boy, are a rare breed? Get off my yeah, he's that. I'm sorry, I'll be back in a that was my favorite memory. He was always for you. This is a true story of me, Bridget Floyd, and this guy, George Perry Floyd Jr., my big brother. And welcome back. Our nation is deeply divided with issues that go beyond simple disagreement. 
The ongoing emergence of binary problems adds to a growing pessimism among citizens and cast shadows over our current state. Yet, organizations like Color Us United work to actively bridge those divisions and promote unity. They support individuals disillusioned by government, corporate, and media portrayals of America as a divisive country. And joining us now to share more is the president of Color Us United, Kenny Shu. And uh, Kenny, good to have you with us. Good to be on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for somebody who may not be so familiar with the organization, obviously, um, give us a little bit about Color Us United and the community that you are serving. That's a good point. We actually advocate for a race-blind America. So we don't care what color of the skin you are when you join Colorist United, as long as you believe that the ideals that unify America are not the ideals of tribe or race or skin color as your identity, but your identity as brothers and sisters, as friends, as neighbors, as family members. Uh, those are all things that are so much more important in your career and in life than your race or your skin color. And if you are willing to unify behind those ideals in a divided time in our country and take on the policies that try to promote division on the basis of race, we will support you, we will help you, we will, we will be your voice. So talk to me about how, do, how you arrived to the conclusion of, you know, no, we, we don't look at skin color. How do you, how do you, why do you think that's beneficial? It's through my personal experience. So my parents are immigrants from China. I was born here in America, and I experienced the great goodness of this country. People, loving people of all races, including Caucasians, took me in, loved on me, schooled me, taught me everything like that, taught me English, you know, taught my, you know, my family when they were poor and everything like that with no social connections got them to advance. And a lot of Asian Americans share this story. Their parents come here with no money and social connections. And within one generation, they're out competing whites. They're out competing all Americans in educational advancement, which is logged in my new book, An Inconvenient Minority. So that personal experience really shaped me and showed how it's really not about your race. It's about your culture. It's about what, what do you do with the opportunities that you've been given in society? And I want that message to be heard across uh, the rest of the country. Uh, but you'll have somebody who, like myself, will say, listen, that's, I mean, that's great on personal experience, but if you live on, for instance, the black side of the spectrum, you would understand that you've been in this country for a long time, and much that's been talked about is the fact that uh, access and not being granted that same kind of access or equality or equity. So, so how do you answer, how would you answer that? I think the best kind of access is education. Um, one of the reasons why Asian Americans are successful in the United States, despite having a lot of the disadvantages that a lot of minorities have, is that they rely on education to really move them forward. Asian Americans, for example, study twice as many hours as the average American. The average white person studies eight hours. The average Asian studies 13. The average black person studies 5.5. How can we say that, you know, we are a country divided on the basis of race when there are also vast disparities in cultural achievement as it comes to education. So I would say education is the biggest avenue towards getting out of those kinds of things, and, but it does require hard work, it does require those kinds of things, and I would advocate for those unifying values over a society that says, well, access is determined by skin color. Hang on with me for a minute on this, Kenny, because I want to ask you the question. You can say education, but then on the other side, somebody say, listen, before I can even make it to the school, I got to make it out of my house. And when I deal with the issues of, you know, uh, income, income inequality, when I listen to the issues of housing, housing discrimination, I can listen to all these other things before I even get to the area of education. Granted that education is very important, but there's so many other areas that we can tackle before we get to education. Follow what I'm saying? I do, and I would like to bring up the example of New York City. In New York City, Asian Americans are actually the population that are most in poverty. Actually, they have the highest poverty rate out of all of the racial groups, higher than even black Americans. Why? Well, because a lot of the Asian Americans are store owners, they're street sweepers, they are people who are way under the poverty rate. But if you look at these low-income Asian Americans' educational achievement, even despite facing all of these income disadvantages, they're actually higher in terms of math and reading test scores 
than even white Americans. Even upper middle class white Americans are outcompeted by low income Asians in New York City. Don't take my word for it. Go buy my book, An Inconvenient Minority, to see for yourself. I've spoken with a lot of these poor Asian Americans. And by the way, poor people of all races, including black Americans. And these people agree. How are they able to advance beyond their poverty? It is through the educational ideal. And they spend a lot of work. They spend all of their extra pennies that they work in the restaurants um, on their children and on helping them uh, rise in education. I think that's the story for uh, a lot of different demographics. Let me go back to you. Uh, on the statistics, you said that Asian Americans lead in poverty. Can you, can you clarify that again, once again? They lead in poverty in New York City. That's what I meant. And according to who? Uh, according to the North, according to the New York City um, poverty statistics. New York City poverty statistic by because I'm 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 not I've I've studied poverty for a minute. I uh -huh. didn't get that I didn't get that statistic. I just wanted to just double check and you know we got a fact check on the show. So I got to make sure that, you know, what it is, is that's why I said, where did you get that statistic from? Because uh, there will be some that challenge. Yeah, I think it comes from the employment and poverty statistics and the local government sources. But, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that that's, that's where I got it from. So talk to me about social identities, because obviously there's social identities that exist out there. And uh, how does putting the social identity aside actually help somebody? How does what, sorry? When you put social identity aside, how does it affect, what, how, what kind of effect does that create? It means that I can approach you without assumptions based on the color of your skin. You and I, you see, we're having a polite, respectful conversation. That's how we should approach each other. You shouldn't make assumptions about me, my politics, my background based on my skin color. And I shouldn't make assumptions about you. These days, there are a lot of um, black Americans who are upper income, there are a lot of Asians who are lower income, They're, and your, the way that you appear, the way that you dress, the way that you speak, those are all important in recognizing who you are as a person. And so I encourage people to practice colorblindness, which is to intentionally, you know, not assume things about a person's background based on their skin color. Talk to me, you also uh, took on Harvard University and, uh, you had an issue with Harvard University. Let's bring it to the forefront. What was that about? So Harvard University was practicing the opposite of what I've been preaching, which is they are making assumptions about you based on your skin color. If you are identify as an Asian American, or even if you don't, if you just have an Asian last name, Harvard is going to rate you significantly lower on a thing called a personality test. Um, which is it, which is um, determinant of your ability to get into Harvard. Uh, they would rate Asians lowest out of all of the races on this personality test, just to admit uh, others with lower standards. Asians, of course, are scoring the highest academically. They're scoring the highest extracurricularly, extracurricularly at Harvard. But the personality score is what dooms them, and it's unfair and it's discriminatory. Uh, I led the charge with Students for Fair Admissions to fight against that, and we recently won at the Supreme Court. So when you talk about that uh, win, how does that feel for you, given the fact that uh, it was an uphill struggle? It was a huge uphill struggle. You know, people told me, even when I was early on, don't fight for rejected college Asians. They're not sexy. They're not somebody you should fight for. Nobody cares anyway. But it turns out a lot of Americans do care because Americans fundamentally want people to be treated on the basis of merit. They don't want skin color for or against somebody. 75% of Americans believe race should not be used in college admissions. And in every state in which people try to use race in college admissions, it has been rejected, even in California, a very liberal state. So we care about minorities, we should care about helping minorities, but that should be done at the K-12 level. That should not be done in the college level. Well, you know, the problem is when you get to college, we have a history of universities, colleges, who simply do not admit, and you can say, listen, you've, they've been given an equal platform and have been given an equal platform for a long period of time. And in the process of being given an equal platform for a long period of time, have failed to just demonstrate equality and equity when it comes to, and I don't even want to say equity, because you have plenty of people where we have examples who are academically credible to enter into an institution 
but do get bypassed just on this issue. On, do get bypassed on the issue of race, and and this has been a long-standing issue for a while. How do you how do you you know answer that? Yeah, I would say you know universities have long struggled with the issue about how to build a diverse and in, an inclusive space. Um, I would say that. Um, the best way to build a diverse, inclusive space is to treat people based on their merit, right? If you start lowering standards, which Harvard had been doing for Black Americans, they were accepting Black Americans with SAT scores 270 plus points lower than Asian Americans. Um, if you start lowering standards, you actually create a segregated culture because students will tend to study together in the same cohort of people who are academically in their range. And if you're not academically in their range, they're going to exclude you. So what's the best way to build an inclusive campus is to not lower standards, is to make sure that everybody admitted is qualified so that they can mingle with each other as academic equals. Well, you know, the thing about academic standards is, Kenny, that you got to think about it here. SATs are standardized scores, and everybody may not fare well in a standardized score. I wasn't great at, at taking standardized tests, but guess what? I graduated at the dean's list at the top of my class, but yet and still I didn't do well in the SAT. Matter of fact, didn't do too well whatsoever. I think there's a conversation that needs to be had for people who don't necessarily do well on standardized tests and that being the sole barometer for academic merit. Yeah, that is a, that's definitely a conversation you should have. You know, I'm greatly, you know, I'm super glad that you graduated at the top of your dean's list. We want to make sure everybody has a good shot at graduating at the top 25% of their class. And um, I think that the end of affirmative action is going to help that. Well, I think also, well, I don't know, because you, when, you, when you really look at it, the, the fact is you're not talking about underqualified people being uh, about getting in. I think you have people who are actually qualified that are able to go to these institutions, people who, are, who can do the institution very well. Now, on the other hand, when you look at what's going on in these educational institutions, we understand that you're given the opportunity to make a choice, to make a choice. And the reality is there have been plenty of examples, plenty, where you have people of equal score, equal talent, but yet and still, when the number gets picked, it's not those in communities of color. Hence the need for affirmative action. It's not the saying that people are not credible enough to attend a college or a university. It's about the fairness, if you will, sometimes, in the process that has long been. And I think that if we're really going to put the, if we're really going to put it out here, we're at, in, in the end by this law in in some way, shape, or form. It also says we're going to rely on the university to do what's right. When in many cases the university and the college hasn't done what's right historically. Yeah, that's why the need for the law exactly, exists. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm saying. The university has not done right. They have lowered standards to admit less qualified black Americans. They have raised standards to discriminate against high qualified Asian Americans. And, you know, they have done they have done it for legacies, too. They have admitted lower qualified legacy students and children of donors because they want to get rich off of their legacy package. This is not right. This is not fair. I'm pushing for fairness. I want everybody to be admitted based on merit. You know, and I get your frustration with standardized test scores, but they are still the best way to determine objectively, toe to toe, which applicant is competitive. Now, with we're going to disagree applicant. right there, it's brother. I can tell you that right now. We're going to disagree. You can, I'm not going to sit here and say the standardized test scores are the best way to determine whether or not somebody's the best student or not. If you've got an A average wow. going throughout the course of the, if you got an A average going through the course of the year, you go and you take that SAT and you mess that SAT up. That is not the, that should not be the sum total of your whole educational experience. That's one test, and that one test cannot you have be an the a basis. A average of that. in courses that are not rigorous. It's not the same as having an A average in courses that are. Say again, in courses that are not rigorous. If you have an A average in courses that are not rigorous, it's not the same as having an A average in courses that are. So when I get to Harvard or an, a, a, another institution, I'm going to take some of these courses, right? I mean, all these courses that I'm taking in college and universities are not going to be as rigorous either. Look, I'm really glad that you graduated in, the, in your dean's No, no, let's take out to do with me. No, 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 take me out of the equation. Take me out of the equation. I'll tell you I'm the done. hard facts. 
The black Americans at Duke University who go to the math major have a three times likelier rate of dropping out of that STEM major and going to a less rigorous major because of affirmative action. That is a fact. Go to that Arsidiakono paper 2012, okay? I'm trying to help black Americans succeed. And black Americans do not succeed when they are put in classes in which they are admitted because of affirmative action. I don't think you're trying to help black Americans succeed because you can't speak for black Americans, man. You can't do that. You can't say that. Now, you might be trying to help yourself succeed, but you can't, say that you, you can't say that you're helping black Americans su succeed because guess what? That's not, that's not the path to success. You ask most black Americans about the end of affirmative action and this, and this recent law that's happened in the Supreme Court, they're going to tell you they're not in favor of that because it's not about the fact that you're talking... You, it's not about the fact of, of merit as being said. You've got credible people who have not been given a shot and it has been long his standing, long historic, that black people have not been given a fair shot. It's not about equality. It's about equality. It's about equity as well. And so when you talk something like that, you got to be able to say the whole story. And the whole story is that there has been a history, long-standing history. So now the end of affirmative action is here, and we're hoping, what the hope is, that somebody's going to do right that hasn't done right already. And I think that's absolutely insane to think that in the end, we're going to hold the people who haven't done right to now do right who haven't done right. That doesn't make no sense. Make it make sense, bro. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to help students, including students of color, is at the K-12 level. Um, we need to make sure that our public school system has qualified teachers. We need to make sure that the standards are raised. We need to make sure that school discipline policies are, are successfully executed so that the students uh, can learn and be in an environment where they can learn. Um, that's what my new book, School of, of Woke, is all about, because it tells about how the K-12 system has gone in such disarray. So if, uh, if I have a lot of thoughts on public education. I'm willing to talk about it, um, but that's my answer to that. Yeah, we can we, we continue this conversation all day. It's been good talking, man. I mean, I, I appreciate the conversation, uh, and I think that there's some things that really need to be discussed, but when we look at what the educational system is right now, both in K-12 and also in higher education, we know what the challenges are. We know what the disparities are. So, I mean, to a certain extent, I understand what you're saying, uh, and to a certain extent, I respectfully disagree, but I do want to give you the opportunity to let people know where they can ch uh, check you out and catch your work. Well, I appreciate it. So you can uh, check me out at Kenny M. Shu, Kenny M. X. U. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, where, and uh, buy my new book, School of Woke and an Inconvenient Minority, where I talk about these issues with people who respectfully disagree. Um, at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and IndieBound, wherever books are sold. And so, what's coming up next for you? <laughs> Uh, lots of things, new initiatives with Colorist United, just making sure that high standards are achieved. My next issue that I'm really passionate about is an issue that you are passionate about as well, which is um, making sure that K-12 education gives the right standards to all children. All right, Kenny, we're going to leave it there, man. It's been good having you here. Thanks for being with us here right, on the show. thank you. All righty. All right, thanks. want to let you know we come to the end of our show today. Hope that you enjoyed this week's discussion on the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forums. To rewatch this week's edition, you can catch the Recablecast right here on Bronxnet.org. If you want to join the conversation, present your point of view, <laughs> visit our social media at Bronxnet TV. Join us next week. We'll elevate the discussion. <laughs> As you can see, the conversation got elevated. <laughs> we'll bring further awareness across the globe. All right, Darren Hami say take care. We'll see you soon.